In what seems like only yesterday, a trio of dreamers banded together to create and succeed in an impossible dream. To fly around the world without stopping and without refueling. Now I want to take you back to December 14, 1986. And we're sitting in a cockpit of this airplane and we're looking down a long runway at Edwards Air Force Base. It's the longest runway in the free world and on the other end of this three mile runway is a beautiful dry lake called Muroc Dry Lake. And if something happens to this takeoff roll of this airplane, then maybe we can survive by landing out in the dry lake someplace. Word of the Voyager project quickly spread. Volunteers migrated from all over the world to help this dream become reality. Each had a special task, and without their good work, this flight could never have been achieved. Anyway, we did work real hard, and we physically built this airplane. We got the very finest carbon fiber from Hercules. We went up to their autoclaves up in Salt Lake City, spent five weeks. We laid up the spars in an autoclave that would give us a little bit more strength in the structure of the airplane. And then we started flying the airplane. One of the first times we flew the airplane, I remember taking off and that's the only time the airplane ever flew with only one person. It's called high risk. And you get to do high risk alone. <laughs> you look around the cockpit and you're by yourself and there's probably a reason for that. <laughs> I took off and the airplane seemed to fly okay. But I looked down and I saw the strangest shadow. And for the first time I realized this is really a weird airplane. Look at the shadow that it caused. I'm flying an airplane that makes that shadow. <laughs> After considerable on-the-spot engineering, challenges were overcome. Dick complained to Bert about the terrible turning qualities of the aircraft when it had a heavy load, and about the horrible handling qualities in the rain. The airplane was highly compromised for range. Highly compromised for range. That means the vertical tails were just, just barely big enough to keep it going in the straight direction. And sometimes when you try to turn the airplane, the dihedral and the adverse yaw would make it turn back the opposite direction. I remember the first time I went into a real steep bank and the Voyager about 20 degrees is a steep bank and I tried to roll out and it yawed a little bit and rolled back the opposite direction. So the more I turned it to the right, the faster it turned to the left. And finally we uh, uh, neutralized everything, tried something else, uh, made it lighter, went into kind of zero G to roll the airplane out. And I told Bert about that and he says, Dick, he says, remember it's mission adequate flying qualities. I says, yeah, Bert. Then he says, Dick, he always says that to me when, <laughs> when he thinks that I need to know something because I'm, well, whatever. He says, Dick, it's a world flight. It doesn't have to turn at all. <laughs> During one of the test flights, we flew into a little rain shower. And in the high desert of Mojave, there's not a lot of rain, so we flew into the rain. And the canard is a very special airfoil, highly loaded airfoil. So when we hit the rain, it disturbed the lift of the canard and the nose started down and it started heading for the desert. And not a thing I could do with the elevator or with the, with the throttle or anything that we could recover from the dive. And right away I could tell that there wasn't enough time to turn this big airplane around and fly out of it before we hit the desert floor. And I told Gina, get your parachute on because you're getting out. And I ordered her to bail out of the airplane because I didn't think we were going to make it. And she says, what are you going to do? And I says, well, I'm going to stay with the airplane. So she put her parachute away and says, I'm staying too. Well, fortunately, fortunately, the rain quit and we flew through the little shower and it pulled out. And I'm not saying we pulled out in the weeds, but it was low enough to be out of control that it made you somewhat nervous. So I landed and went back and, and fortunately for my brother, for my brother's life, he wasn't there at the airport. I called him on the phone. <laughs> and I says, Bert, and I told him what happened. And his response was, don't fly in the rain. <laughs> I says, Bert, we're going around the world at the equator. You know how much rain and bad weather is around the world? Anyway, we had a lot of fun, but the one that I liked the best was the size of the fuselage. Now, the bigger, the fatter the fuselage and more comfortable it is, that means that uh, the airplane goes slower and it has more drag and it has less range. So he designed the cockpit, he said, just big enough for us to survive the flight and the required 48 hours you have to live afterwards. 
And he says, if you live longer than the flight and the required 48 hours after the flight, obviously it was too big and we just had wasted range capability. Finally, after nearly six years of design, building, and flight tests, it was time to make the attempt. So Gene and I crawled in the airplane that morning and fired up the engines. And the wings were, uh, they were heavily laden with three and a half tons of fuel. They were bent down towards the taxiway. The boom tanks that you see left and right up there, they were all bent down. In fact, the fuselage was contorted so bad that I couldn't even get the canopy in it. And I thought, we never had this much fuel in it. It's a frail airplane. I mean, the, the carbon fiber was as thin as a sheet of paper and bonded left top and bottom to Nomex paper honeycomb. The press called it the paper airplane. And they're almost right. But the airplane was twisted so much that the canopy wouldn't fit. And this morning, the engines were running, the press was there, and we had clearance to go around the world. And I couldn't get the canopy in the airplane. So with a fist and pounding it real hard, we finally popped it into position. And I thought, boy, I may have been better off if I couldn't get it in there. I called the tower that morning and said, Edwards Tower, this is Voyager 1. Sir, we're ready to go. And he says, Voyager 1, this is Edwards Tower. ATC clears Voyager 1 from Edwards Air Force Base to Edwards Air Force Base via flight plan route. Maintain 8,000. Cleared for takeoff and Godspeed. 